A couple of years ago, I made a video about breeding rams, and I spent the majority of that video talking through what it was like to have the parents raise the fry, and really glossed over the process of raising them artificially. I know a lot of people struggle with that aspect, and it's been on my to-do list for a while to walk through the process in more detail, and see if I can show an example that might get you a little bit closer. This time I'll start from the spawn, and then move forward. So I've got this young female here, and she's been very eager for a chance to spawn. I got her recently as part of a new group, and she happened to be the only female. During quarantine, I housed her with the rest of the males, but since she was woefully outnumbered, I kept her physically divided, separated by a transparent divider. She spawned a couple of times right up against the divider, but all the males could do was watch and try really hard to learn how to teleport. This is the first time she's had any chance of her eggs being fertilized, and it takes practice. More on the part of the male, I suspect. I like having them spawn on top of sheltered clay saucers like this because they're easy to move and reorient for artificial hatching. More on that in just a moment. What we see here is the female laying rows of eggs in a fairly dense cluster, followed shortly by the male taking passes over the eggs to fertilize them. In the ram spawns I've watched or recorded, this usually takes somewhere around 30 minutes. But I like to give them an extra hour or so just to make sure that they're really finished. They do tend to start and stop a few times toward the end, and every egg counts. Eventually the action dies down, and with apologies to the fish, I pull the eggs and with only a few seconds out of water, place them somewhere safe to hatch. I've had good luck historically with hatching them in a specimen container with the spawning surface propped up at an angle so that the fry can fall freely down as they hatch. The water inside this container is chemically similar to where the eggs were laid, but brand new and perfectly clean, at least for now. I like to run an airline down to the bottom and run it at a decent pressure to keep the water circulating and aerated. By ram standards, this is a small to medium-sized spawn, which is to be expected from the first spawn of a young pair. Still, this is a large number of eggs in close proximity to each other, so I use methylene blue to prevent fungal growth. By the next day, it's usually apparent which eggs are infertile. Thanks to the methylene blue, they won't pose any threat to the fertile eggs around them, and as a bonus, it also dyes them blue just to let us know what a good job it's doing. I've mentioned before that methylene blue is kind of a double-edged sword. It's great for keeping fungus at bay, but that's because it kills things. It's useful now, but as soon as those eggs hatch, we want it gone. In this scenario, that usually means a series of careful water changes, and sometimes I don't have the time or the patience for it. So here's what I do instead. I consider when the eggs are going to hatch. For me, with a water temperature of 84 degrees, the eggs hatch in less than 48 hours. The two spawns you'll see in this video hatched at 40 and 44, for example. Sometime in the last four to eight hours, I change all the water at once. I remove the eggs from the blue water and then quickly dunk them back into a fresh container of clean water. Now the fungus is no longer inhibited, but by this point the eggs will hatch faster than the fungus grows. And here we have the wigglers. It can take a few hours from start to finish, but one by one they'll break loose from their eggs and do as their name implies. Their bodies are adhesive, so they tend to cling to the surface where they hatched for a while, but eventually they fall to the bottom of the container and stick to something else, usually each other. At this stage they're still undeveloped and fairly helpless, so I leave them alone. I keep the airline in place to keep the water aerated, but otherwise I think the less you do at this point the better. Over the next days, you should see them gradually darken in color, especially in the eyes. After roughly three days, you should see the fry starting to hold themselves upright and taking short hops across the floor. From here, I would say another 8 to 12 hours later, they should all be up and moving. I like to wait until this point to try to move them anywhere, and a few more hours still before trying to feed them. For this first spawn, I'm going to transfer them to one of my new fry trays. I try to do this as carefully as possible by tilting the container and slowly pouring the fry out into their new space. I keep a pipette filled with water off to the side and use that to flush out any stragglers still clinging to the sides. Most often I like to put some kind of leafy or otherwise dense vegetation into their space, but it's not as a food source. It might bring some edible critters with it, but in my opinion an infinitesimal amount compared to what these fry will need. I value vegetation instead as a breakwater something to break up the flow of water through a container like this and create regions where the fry won't be burning calories resisting a current. When raising tiny active fry in warm water like this, the next few days will be a metabolic balancing act between feeding, expending, and conserving energy. To that end, I have the water flow into this container very low and deliberately dampened. I'll be spending a good deal of time on early feeding strategies shortly. 
I also have a rigid airline tube releasing bubbles from just under the surface. It provides enough surface agitation to prevent a protein film from forming on the surface, but it's gentle enough not to knock the fry around. The odds are, you probably don't have one of these fry trays, and that's okay. Specific equipment is less important than how you use it or modify it to fit your purposes. And I hope by discussing the principles at work here, you can make do with what you have. As lovely as these fry are, I want to take a quick step back. Right around this time, I had another spawn from the same parents, and this time a much larger one. Not just larger, but also with a higher overall fertility rate, because practice makes perfect. I thought this might be more fun to watch, and also I want to share a different hatching tactic that I tried for this batch. Sometimes I just like to try things, and in this case it worked out well. This time, just before the eggs hatched, I moved the saucer directly into the fry tray and let them hatch in place. My thinking was, I could skip that somewhat rough event of transferring the fry from one container to another. I guess I could have tilted the saucer up on its side like I did before, but I left it laying down like it would be if the parents were still tending to it. I do think it was helpful to subject the fry to less jostling around, but I really had to wear my parental ram hat to keep things clean. Just like the parents would, I had to carefully remove the infertile and rapidly fungusing eggs, and in some cases even pick up and move the wigglers around to make space for my comparatively clumsy pipette. I also brought in the airline tube again, this time positioned right above the wigglers to keep water circulating. If the parents were here, they would be floating right on top of them and fanning water across them with their fins. If I were grading myself on ability to be a ram parent, I'd give myself about a B plus, but I'm not quitting my day job. After the same three-day period of development, we're caught back up with a large and extra-glorious batch of free-swimming fry. This time I decided to skip the vegetation because if this fry tray does what it's supposed to do, I shouldn't need it. Instead, I left the saucer in place for a while just to act as some kind of central focal point for the fry, something other than a white box. Most people, I think, can get to free-swimming fry just fine. It's the first few days after that where things get tricky. So let's talk about keeping these things alive, which is easier said than done. The problem with baby rams is that they're stupid. They're supposed to have parents keeping them in line, and without those parents, they can get themselves into all kinds of trouble. I don't know a better way to describe it than to compare it to the mythological lemming behavior. Normally, their instinct is to stay near their parents. Otherwise, they're attracted first to each other, second to bright sources of light, and third, they're somewhat drawn to water flow. And when that means a filtered drain or the strong current of an incoming water source, it's bad times. Their attraction to light, in particular, is something I think is worth some concern. In my opinion, having intense lighting directly above the fry could be disastrous in the first few days. Instead of doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is looking for food, they might spend all day worshipping the sun instead. I had a chance to talk to Dean about rams recently, and he shared a great tip with me. This was to use their light sensitivity to my advantage. He recommended using a focused gooseneck lamp to illuminate the regions where I want the fry to congregate. I tried it on these batches, and I have to say, it works like a charm. Not just for the fry, but as he pointed out, for baby brine shrimp when that time comes. But brine shrimp are a few days down the road. First, I start with much smaller foods. One of my favorite early fry foods are paramecium. They're small, easy to see, and they move constantly, which makes them very appealing to the fry. I release them into the tray and let the fry hunt them down. This is my way of making absolutely sure that they get some calories, and at this point, that's really all that matters. There's very little waste involved in feeding paramecium, and I've actually taken to turning the water off for a while to keep them from escaping the container and in general slow things down a bit. I haven't tried that until recently, but I think I really like it. In addition to the paramecium, I also offer a fry powder mixed with water. I've shown Sarah Micron a lot recently, but as powders go, it can be a bit coarse. This time I used New Life Spectrum's powder, which is very fine and tends to stay suspended in the water column a little bit longer. A powder can be applied to the surface, but if you look at how their mouths are oriented, I don't think these fry are really meant to be surface feeders. They'll do it, but I like to make things easier for them by getting their food into the water column. Powders are nutrient-rich, which is great, but they're also high waste, so I always keep the water flowing and use a small siphon to periodically remove any excess. This combination of foods, paramecium for guaranteed calories, and fry powder for high protein and other nutrients, I think is very effective. Either option by itself works also. Alternating between the two foods, I feed the fry every two or three hours if possible. 
For rams, I think this is especially important because of the temperature and that metabolic balance I referred to earlier. If they're awake and moving, they need to be eating, almost constantly. On that note, I've talked in the past about keeping lights on at night while raising rams, but that doesn't really apply here. You might keep a tank illuminated at night to keep the parents attentive and stable, but in that scenario the fry are in a tank full of potential food sources, not a Stanley Kubrick white box. In this environment, if I'm not awake to be feeding, they need to be sleeping. Otherwise, they would spend all night burning calories without food to replace them. Plus, when they go to sleep, they do this balled-up Megazord thing that's fun to watch in the morning. Throughout their second day, they should be strong and active, rarely holding still for long. If you see many of them resting on the bottom or in the meniscus of the water, that would be a sign that things aren't going well. Somewhere in this second day, if they've put on enough size, you might start introducing vinegar eels. I have mixed feelings about vinegar eels, honestly. They're narrow, but also really long, and I think it can still be a struggle for the fry to take them. I can tell you with certainty that they will, but with other foods on hand that are easier to handle, I would consider them to be optional, if not superfluous. On the third day, I start introducing small amounts of brine shrimp as a test to see how well they're taken. Now, I don't think it's productive to say, on day one feed this, on day two feed that instead, and on day three feed something else. It doesn't always work so predictably, and it helps to just track their growth, use good judgment about what they seem large enough to handle, and try the next food in small amounts to see how it's taken. In other words, the right time to switch to a larger food is when the fry start eating that larger food. There's no set timeline. I want to be using brine shrimp as soon as possible because it accelerates fry growth so much. It's my absolute favorite fry food, I can't say that enough. But as much as I love them, I'm trying to be careful about how quickly I make that transition. Cichlid fry especially are impetuous eaters, and if they cram themselves too full of brine shrimp before they're ready, they can do irreparable damage to their swim bladders. That's been my observation anyway. Once I've switched fully to brine shrimp, it isn't necessary or helpful to feed so often. They're larger and take longer to digest, so the fry get full and stay full longer. At this point, I would say I feed more like three to four times throughout the day, and as the fry grow larger and eat a larger volume of food at one time, I proportionately increase the water flow into the tray, just to make sure things stay clean. I should also mention water changes, because for me, that's been the most frequent question I've gotten about raising rams. There seems to be a perception that they need exceptionally clean water as they grow. I don't have evidence to suggest that they care more about water quality than any other fish, but I do try to keep my water as clean as I have time to manage. It's impossible for me or anyone else to prescribe how often you should change your water, because that depends on what, how much, and how often you feed, and what water volume you're doing this in. This tray happens to be sitting on a 5 gallon tank, and after the first week I think I was doing 50% water changes twice a week. Nothing out of the ordinary for this volume of fish. I personally would recommend focusing more about the tank being effectively filtered than on exactly how often you change your water. From here there isn't much change to my part of the process. I do the same thing each day and they keep growing. I'll show you what that looks like over the next month. This is about 10 days later. When you see them multiple times a day, every day, it's easy to lose track of how much they've grown, especially when viewed from above. Still having these partially translucent bodies, these look less developed than they really are. Here they are a few weeks later, and these to my eyes are now comfortably in the juvenile phase. Two remaining questions I can see being asked are how long to keep them confined, and when to switch to prepared foods. For the first, that's kind of a judgment call. If there were a smaller number of fish in here, I might keep them longer, but I released these into a larger tank at the size that you see here. They were looking a little bit cramped. As soon as they're strong enough to handle a larger space, I think they're ready. As for the prepared food, I would just expect them to be picky about it at first and attempt that transition past the point where a day or two without a normal food intake won't cause them irreparable harm. I could see that being as early as two to three weeks, maybe, but personally I don't try to switch fully to prepared foods until they're closer to adult size. That's just my preference. So here they are, running loose in a 10 gallon. I'll be keeping them here for just a couple of weeks while I make space for them in a larger grow out tank. Like I mentioned in the beginning, if you've struggled to raise rams artificially, I hope this gets you a little closer to where you want to be. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but with high effort comes high reward. On my part, I really enjoyed seeing this work well in the new fry tray. 
I don't know if I've ever mentioned this, but it was actually Rams that got me working on this thing in the first place, and I've always considered them to be the benchmark for whether it works like I intended. So far, so good, and I'll leave it there. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.